John Jamelski's story, he kept kidnapping women for 15 years. How do you think you'd feel if at 15 years old you were locked in a room for three years? How would you feel about being tortured and humiliated each and every day? That's exactly what John Jamelski did with his victims, kidnapping them and keeping them as slaves for years at a time. So how did law enforcement finally catch up to him after all of 15 years? This is the John Jamelski story. They vanished one by one, kidnapped from their families, taken where no one could hear their screams. You could hear the doors clanging. I thought I was gonna die. What was happening in this quiet suburb? He forced you to have Yes. Every single day. Every single day. Terrified women kept chained like animals, locked away for months, even years. And he was their captor, a bizarre millionaire. John T. Jamelski was born in Fayetteville, New York, near DeWitt, a suburb of Syracuse, in 1935. His father was a watchmaker, and in high school, he was a very quiet and withdrawn boy, rarely speaking with anyone. An academic underachiever, he enjoyed history classes, but disliked maths and avoided sports. After graduating from Morrisville State College with a degree in watchmaking in 1955, he had a few blue-collar jobs and married a schoolteacher named Dorothy Richmond. They had three sons together, though, Tragically, the firstborn died as an infant. Although his entire family knew about the bunker under his house, they were unaware that he used it as a dungeon. In 1988, the same year that he committed his first kidnapping, his wife became ill and eventually passed away in 1999. In 1988, John convinced his father to invest in stocks. When he and his wife died, Jamelski received a sizable inheritance. He invested the money in a real estate in California and Nevada, and by 2000, he had become a millionaire through his dealings. But in spite of his fortune, he lived frugally and was even often seen collecting beer cans and bottles from trash cans for the deposit. At the time of his arrest, he had a collection of over 13,000 bottles in his possession, which were sold on eBay for $500 sometime after his conviction. He even made arrangements with libraries to save the food coupons, including in subscription magazines for him. When the DeWitt area in which Jamelski lived was purchased and other properties were remodeled and improved, Jamelski simply built a tall wooden fence around his house instead. In October 1988, Jamelski abducted his first victim, a 14-year-old Native American girl. He held her captive for over two years. Jamelski compelled her to his will by threatening violence against her younger brother, and she made no attempt to make a report to authorities after Jamelski released her. Sometime around 1995, Jamelski also abducted a 14-year-old Latina runaway, first luring her under the premise of paying her to deliver a secret package. The girl willingly walked into his bunker, which he called the dungeon, and Jamelski closed the door behind her. Eventually, Jamelski put a blindfold on her and drove her to her mother's apartment, dropping her off. Despite threatening her family, she did go to the police with a description, but due to her previous drug use, authorities questioned the credibility of her story, dropping the investigation shortly after. On August 31st, 1997, Jamelski kidnapped a 53-year-old Vietnamese woman off the street. She was a foreign refugee with limited English who he forced into his car, taking her to an abandoned house where he assaulted her. He then tied her to flattened cardboard boxes and transported her to his house. Keeping her captive and subjecting her to daily he also compelled her to perform various menial tasks. On May 23rd, 1998, he released her at a Greyhound bus station, providing her with $50. She reported the incident to the police that day, but nothing came of it. Despite her claims that the police didn't believe her, Syracuse police spokesman, Sergeant 
Thomas Connellan stated that they investigated all leads, but none of them panned out. On May 11th, 2001, Jamalski offered a ride home to a 26-year-old woman walking in downtown Syracuse while under the influence of LSD, which the woman accepted due to the poor weather. Jamalski took her back to his bunker where he ripped her daily. When she resisted, Jamalski inflicted cigar burns on her, from which she developed an abscess on her lower back. Jamalski also manipulated her with claims that he was actually part of an underground slavery syndicate of which the police were a part. The victim wanted to write home to her parents, letting them know she was alive, and while Jamelski did agree, he insisted she tell them that she was in a drug rehabilitation clinic. After the previous victim's release, police investigations were complicated by the letter she had been forced to write by Jamelski. Further complicating the case was the kit test showing no evidence of assault, with Jamelski having no contact with the victim for several days prior to releasing her. The victim told the police he drove a tan 1974 Mercury Comet. So the police searched for registered vehicles fitting this description in the New York area and found a single hit. However, the lead didn't pan out because the victim's description of the vehicle didn't match the one discovered. So due to this inconsistency, the investigating officers closed the case. It is noted that despite that body style being available from 1971 to 1977, police didn't search any other year with the car Jamelski drove being a 1975 Mercury Comet of the same color. Representatives from the Syracuse police appeared on Dateline NBC and criticized the woman for providing insufficient information. In another interview on the program, Cold Case Files, Onon Dagger, Sheriff's Department detective stated, well, at the time it was difficult. I've had a couple of missing adults who were missing because they wanted to be missing. During the same program, the victim claimed, they didn't believe me all because of the letter I wrote about the drug rehab. They thought I was making up some story or something. Concerning the letter written by the victim to her family, the detective again stated, the letter was read and examined by the family members of the missing woman and the family all said it was her handwriting, it was her vocabulary, and they weren't suspicious at all that it was anything other than her writing. So from a standpoint of us investigating a missing person's case, the case was closed. In October 2002, Jamelski picked up his final abductee, a 16-year-old African-American runaway from Syracuse. On April 3rd, 2003, Jamelski felt confident enough to take the girl out to karaoke at a local bar. Emboldened by this success, he then took her on another public outing where she slipped away from him long enough to phone her sister. The girl's sister checked the caller ID and dialed the number back which turned out to be a bottle return center located in Manilius. The older sister persuaded the employee who answered the phone to call 911. The employee in turn called her boss who was working at a local pet store several blocks away, telling him that Jamelski, who was scheduled to visit him at the store shortly, had apparently kidnapped a young girl and had been m***ing her. After Jamelski and the girl had made their visit and left, the boss immediately called the police. Jamelski was tracked down and arrested shortly thereafter. Jamelski pleaded guilty to five counts of first-degree kidnapping and is currently serving a term of 18 years to life. Part of his guilty plea agreement was that his assets would be sold off and divided among his victims. In a prison interview with MSNBC, Jamelski said that he should not be punished for what he did and that once arrested, he had thought he would at most spend a couple of days in jail, pay a fine or perform community service. He said that his lawyers had to spend several days after his arrest to make it clear to him that taking women and holding them in a dungeon counts as kidnapping in the eyes of the law. Be doing it? No, I don't think I would because I was taking Viagra 
towards the end, and it would have ended because I don't have, I don't, I don't have the the physical urges that I had before. And I, and I told her, I said, we got to have less. So you couldn't keep up at the end. No, no, no. But there were still plenty of questions ahead. While Jamelski cooled his heels in jail, authorities desperately tried to get a final number on how many victims there were, and if there were any who did not make it out of the dungeon alive. Coming up, sensational charges and an emotional outcome. I've had a long time to think about it. I'm very sorry for what I did. When MSNBC reports continue. And now the conclusion to our story. To the community, he had seemed so mild-mannered. A grocer retired from his job. A grandfather. A widower who had spent years nursing his sick wife. But for 15 years, police say John Jamelski had another identity. As a slave master in a makeshift underground dungeon, he had built himself to a and a string of young women. Now he's heading to trial, accused of kidnapping and and there would be a drama in the courtroom. Once more, here's Rob Stafford. In early summer 2003, John Jamelski entered a Syracuse courtroom for the first time. After two months of saturation coverage, the place was packed with people who wanted to see the notorious dungeon master up close. Investigators determined that over 15 years, there had been five victims ranging in age from 14 to 52, and all had survived to tell someone. They were ethnically diverse, one Native American, one African American, one Hispanic, one Vietnamese, and one Caucasian. Three told investigators they had known their captor by a biblical name, Joshua, Peter, or Paul. One said he told her to call him Fish. Four positively picked Jamelski's mugshot from a photo array but each described the dungeon in detail. Your Honor, for purposes of the Mr. It was certain to be a sensational trial, and everyone wondered, would an elderly man looking at life behind bars mount an insanity defense or gamble on an outright acquittal in the face of such damning evidence? But when the time came to speak for himself, John Jamelski did neither. That you are going to plead guilty to each and every count in this indictment. In a prearranged deal with prosecutors, Jamelski agreed to plead guilty to five counts of kidnapping and let his victims divvy up his estimated million dollar estate in return for a sentence of 18 to life. How do you plead? After 15 years of subjecting others to mental torture and slavery, the Syracuse dungeon master had quickly tired of the public spotlight. You are a sick coward. You're an evil man, you're a kidnapper and a Your reign of terror is over. For once, Jamelski seemed uncharacteristically contrite. When his time came to speak, he was brief and emotional. I'm just truly sorry for what I did. I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I'm just very sorry for what I did and for how it's affected everyone. God bless all of them. But less than 24 hours later, Jamelski told us his lawyers stopped him from giving the full statement he... In 2004, MSNBC produced episode 12 of their MSNBC Reports series subtitled Bunker on the Jamelski case, periodically rebroadcast several times a year as part of their Doc Block documentary marathons. The case is also covered in the book, True Stories of Law and Order, SVU, the real crimes behind the best episodes of the hit TV show by Kevin Dwyer and Jure Fiorillo. Jamelski is currently housed in the Mohawk Correctional Facility. On December 22nd, 2020, Jamelski was denied parole in his first appearance before the parole board. They vanished one by one kidnapped from their families, taken where no one could hear their screams. You could hear the doors clanging. I thought I was going to die. What was happening in this quiet suburb? He forced you to have 
Yes. Every single day. Every single day. Terrified women kept chained like animals, locked away for months, even years. And he was their captor, a bizarre millionaire. Now, hear him tell his story in a dramatic no. jailhouse interview. I am not this horrible monster. I never hurt anyone. Women alone and forgotten, how did they survive? In the darkest corners of the human mind. I did not want to die down there. On MSNBC Report. Hi, everyone. I'm John Siegenthaler, and this is MSNBC Reports. When young girls disappear, it often becomes a huge national story. Elizabeth Smart, Polly Class, the heartbreaking case of Carly Brucia, the Florida sixth grader who was kidnapped and killed while on her way home from a friend's house. In that investigation, the Amber Alert system combined with media attention to help police find a suspect within days of Carly's disappearance. But sometimes, young women disappear and no one notices. That's exactly what happened in this story. A string of women missing and no one suspected a thing. It wasn't until years later that police were stunned to learn what had really been happening in their community and who had been to blame. He was denied parole again on December 22nd, 2022. Police found Jamelski's residence systematically filled with miscellaneous items of little or no value, newspapers, magazines, beer bottles, receipts, spanning two decades, etc. Further down into the basement behind a storage shelf, police discovered the bunker where Jamelski kept his victims. It had a steel door leading to an eight foot long tunnel which had to be traversed on hands and knees. This tunnel led to yet another steel door, finally opening to a room eight feet high 24 feet long and 12 feet wide. The entry was a small box located just under the top of the room, so the person entering had to turn around and step down into the room via a small three-rung ladder. Jamelski would tie his victims up with a chain that connected to an ankle bracelet. Here is the footage of the dungeon captured by the police officers. They vanished one by one, kidnapped from their families, taken where no one could hear their screams. You could hear the doors clanging. I thought I was going to die. What was happening in this quiet suburb? He forced you to have Yes. Every single day. Every single day. Terrified women kept chained like animals, locked away for months, even years. And he was their captor, a bizarre millionaire. Now, hear him tell his story in a dramatic no. jailhouse interview. I am not this horrible monster. I never hurt anyone. Women alone and forgotten. How did they survive? In the darkest corners of the human mind. I did not want to die down there. On MSNBC. The dungeon had many things written on the wall, most notably religious phrases, as well as numerous peace symbols. When police found the dungeon, they contacted one of the known victims to link Jamelski to her testimony by asking what three words were written on the wall. She correctly responded, Wall of Thugs. A crucifix hung by the door next to Peace to all who enter here, as well as the words Hate and Ready to Ruckus, so bring on the pain in deep crimson. In the centre of the room was a stained bathtub on top of a raised wooden deck. It was here that the victims were forced to bathe using a garden hose. There was a drain plug, but no plumbing. When the tub was drained, the water had nowhere to go, but on the cement floor of the dungeon where it remained until it evaporated, making the room damp and mouldy. An aluminium frame chair with no seat was positioned over a pail, a crude toilet that was used to further degrade the captives. A clock radio sat on top of a filthy, portable refrigerator. Next to a yellow extension cord, which ran out from a hole in the top of the wall, with an 8-inch aluminium hose that pumped warm air from the house furnace. There was also a series of calendars in which the victims systematically had to mark each day. Noted was the letters B, S and T written on the dates. Investigators later discovered these letters were made by the victims who were made to record each date. They were S, 
bathed B, or brushed their teeth T. The collective time span of the calendars covered 15 years. Police found several video recorded entries. At least one woman appeared on the tape. In the videos, Jamelski is seen dancing, singing, and exercising with the woman. Jamelski frequently claimed to his captives that he was part of an Onondanga County Sheriff's Department. He showed them a fake badge he had found on the street years earlier. He also told them he was under certain bosses who were making him engage in these activities. He told his victims under this story that the easier the daily rapes could occur, the faster his bosses might let the girls out. In the videotape police found, the viewer can see the victim pleading with the potential bosses that it would be better if she were home. All of Jamelski's victims were of different ethnic origins, Native American, Latino, Vietnamese, black and white. The district attorney who prosecuted Jamelski's case stated, all five of these women are of different races. I don't believe that's a coincidence. I believe that in his distorted mind, this was another form of collection. So that was the story of John Jamelski. What are your thoughts on this? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more.